Uh, so a little bit about myself. My name is James Laws, and I am the uh, co-founder and CEO of WP Ninjas, the creators of a plugin called Ninja Forms, which are on the sweatshirts that you have there. Uh, I actually got my first sales job about 20 years ago. I was looking for a change in, I don't know, a change in view, a change in direction, and so I applied to an ad in the paper. Now the ad itself didn't really say anything about what the job was. But it talked about this certain lifestyle that I wanted to live, right? I wanted to, have to, to be flexible and travel. I wanted to be able to buy the house that I want, the cars that I want. And so I kind of reluctantly, and yet with a little bit of anticipation, decided I'm going to apply for this job. So I called and I set up my interview, at least what I thought was my interview. And actually, when I showed up, there were 15 other applicants. And we spent about the first four hours and 10 applicants leaving watching what I can only call a propaganda video that was hosted by William Shatner, <laughs> true story, as he interviewed people who were doing this job that we still did not know what this job was. We knew it was sales, that's all we knew. Uh, so mo other, some more people left, only three of us made it through. I wanted to see how far the rabbit hole went. And then I found out I was joining an elite and prestigious group that very few get to say they've been a part of. I became a door-to-door -door <laughs> vacuum salesman. <laughs> it's true. On um, the next day when I showed up, I don't know why I showed up. I should have just said I'm going to go look for a real job. But I went there. Now, now any vacuum, before I say that, <laughs> any door-to-door -door vacuum salesman in the, in the audience. OK. <laughs> I really dodged a bullet there. Uh, I should have said no, but I decided, you know what, I'm going to just try this out. I, I, I'm up for new experiences. And you may not know this, I'm actually an introvert, so door-to-door -door sales, cold call, like that's a scary endeavor. But I decided I'm going to try it out. And they taught me a lot. Uh, so we were selling the Generation 4 Kirby vacuum cleaner. Uh, now this is actually an amazing piece of, of machinery. It was very, I'm not going to sell you one right now. But it was, it was a lot of fun. We had a really good time with it. They also taught me about all these other vacuum cleaners, how to take them apart, why they were inferior. Because really the goal was to destroy their vacuum cleaner so that the Kirby looked all shiny, new, and great. Uh, and I learned other things too. Like, did you know when you're doing door-to-door -door sales, you should use the door that they commonly use? like the door they go to. So if you see a door that's all barred up and locked up, they probably don't use that. You want to knock on the other door because it makes you an insider. It makes you, they know that, okay, this person gets us. So my first day out selling vacuum cleaners, I came to this house and the front door had this kind of walkway that was gated off with these iron gates. The door was iron and there was like vines growing over everything. So I'm like, obviously they don't use this door. But the garage door was open and they had a, <laughs> I feel like you know where this is going. <laughs> the garage door was open. I'm like, obviously, this is the door they use all the time. So I walked in, and you know, to my luck, they had a doorbell in their garage. So I pressed it. Now, this was 20 years ago. I was a lot younger and, and naive and, and maybe just plain stupid. So I ring the doorbell, and I didn't hear a ding. Instead, what I heard was the garage door start to close. <laughs> But all I had in my mind was a sales pitch, right? So I didn't think that presence of mind of if I press this button again, it'll probably just start going back up again. So I did what any common sense person would do in that moment. I re relived all of my action movie days and I went uh, as, as much as I could Indiana Jones on this garage door. <laughs> and so I ran for the door and I dove and barrel rolled under the door. And as I picked myself up and dusted off my jeans and my ego, the guy comes out that gated iron door, wondering why somebody was in his garage. <laughs> Needless to say, I sucked at selling vacuum cleaners. In fact, I never sold one vacuum cleaner. But the truth is, we're not here to talk about selling vacuum cleaners. We're here to talk about web forms. And most of us, in the same respect, suck at building web forms. We're terrible at it. And the reason we're terrible at it is because forms are difficult. It's challenging to build a good form that converts, that people want to fill out and want to engage with you. Uh, the other reason is, is because you get all these tips and people to say, this is what you should do with your forms, but one size does not fit all. You may need different data than someone, somebody else needs. Your form may require more fields. Your, 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 your market could be completely and totally different. So what we're going to talk about today is not about a particular form building plugin. Most of the form building plugins will solve your problem. But what we're going to talk about is techniques that you can apply using whatever form plugin you're currently using, 
or, or if you're like really saucy and want to just hand code it yourself, like you can <laughs> apply these techniques even though forms suck, they don't have to. We can get better at it. Because here's what we all truly know, right? We all know forms are important. We know that that interaction with, with our users, our visitors, our customers, it's extremely important. Why is it important? Because forms provide data. F forms give you data. Oh, yeah, that is funny. I, I'm sorry, I forgot what I even had up there. Um, <laughs> forms provide androids that will come and give you. No. So forms provide data. They provide information for you. And this information, after as collected day after day, year after year, time after time, actually becomes knowledge. And as we all know, right, knowledge is opportunity, right? It's opportunity. It's an opportunity to, to, to do a number of things. Because here's the problem. So web forms suck. And here is why web forms suck. Most people stop with the idea that web forms collect data. So we build forms that look like this. Now this doesn't have any styling, it's just, just a form, right? And we say, well, if web forms collect data, and data produces knowledge, and knowledge is opportunity, then I'm going to ask every single question I can possibly ask. I'm going to ask, what is their you know, kids' shoe sizes? What is their pet's name? What is, I'm going to ask as much information as I possibly can. Strangely enough, this is a little cut off in this, and I don't, uh, there, there it is, all right? This is actually a real form, 1,200 fields. Uh, and this is actually only 25% of it because my, uh, my GIF screen capture couldn't record more than 25% of me scrolling through this form. It, it's, it's pretty insane. But the problem is this is where we stop, right? Forms collect data. But that is a very narrow-minded understanding of what forms are. Remember I said I did door-to-door -door sales for a little while? And here's something that I realized that was more important than anything else. What I was really trying to do in that first interaction is not sell a vacuum cleaner. What I was really trying to do is get permission into someone's home so that I could sell them a vacuum cleaner. But if I didn't get through the door, I wasn't going to sell them a vacuum cleaner on the front porch or in their front yard. I needed to get in the door, right? I needed to have that conversation with them. So what the, part of the problem that we have with forms is we don't realize that forms, yes, collect data, but forms are actually a front door to your user into your user's home, into your user's email, not to you. We think of forms kind of this one-way road, right? I have a form on my site, and you're, giving, you're contacting me. You're coming into my house. You came to my website. You filled out my form, and you've come into my house. But that is a, the, actually the wrong way to think about it. Your web forms are a door to your user's house, your user's email. They're giving you permission. They're giving you access. What are they giving you permission for? They begin a dialogue. Right? You collect data. Data is great. There's a, it's great to have all of this data. It's great to have all of this information. It's great to have this opportunity. But if they don't give you permission into your email, what do you got? Right? You just have a bunch of information that you can't use. And so what we have to start thinking about our forms a little differently is the fact that they are actually giving us permission into their email and permission to start a conversation. So now users aren't just coming to your website and reading information on your website and, and hoping they can find what they want. They're giving you data so that you can custom tailor a response, a dialogue to them. So what is our mission then if we know all of this is the case? Our mission is simple. We, don't want, we want to increase conversions by building better forms, right? Because our forms suck. And nobody wants to fill them out because they're terrible. And they're long. And they're 1,200 fields. And I don't know about you, unless I'm fi filling out a tax form, I don't want to even do that. Like, that's what I ask a lot of people. Like, they're like, I need 1,200 fields for my form. And I'm like, are you like, doing taxes through uh, your web form? Like, this feels like really excessive. So the first thing that I learned when I'm doing door-to-door -door sales is you want to keep it simple. Right? When I was on the door and I knocked on that door, I, again, I was not trying to sell a vacuum cleaner. I was just trying to get in the door. Because once I was in the door, we could have a dialogue, we could have a conversation, I could lay on the charm, I could tell them some jokes, I could show them how filthy their home was, and what a piece of junk their vacuum cleaner was, and how great the Kirby was, and we have this conversation, and we sell vacuum cleaners, although I never sold a vacuum cleaner, so we'll see <laughs> how that goes. So here's a, here's a situation of a, of a basic contact form. It seems to be a little washed out, so you're not seeing the fields. That's kind of terrible. Um, yeah, <laughs> that, that is the worst I have ever seen slides. I should have really added a lot more contrast to this. Well, you'll have to imagine the fields <laughs> underneath those labels. These are two contact forms that I commonly see, right? They ask for first name, last name, an email address, maybe a phone number, a message, an anti-spam field. 
Just look at those two forms. Which are you more likely to fill out? Right? You're most like, more likely to fill out the one on the right because it's simple, right? Three points of information and you got it. The question you have to ask yourself is, can I get the phone number later? Like, do I need it right now? All I really want is permission into their email box. Once I've got that, everything is great. So I just want to get in the front door. This is the most important thing. Here's a common uh, web subscription form. Again, some of the fields are missing, but uh, lots, of, uh, lots of these newsletter programs, MailChimp, uh, Campaign Monitor, Constant Contact, they, when they, you build a list, they immediately give you first name, last name, email address. And so I think sometimes we think we have to use those. And so we put first name, last name, email address. But do you need their first and last name to send them a newsletter? Right? You just need their email address. Chances are you haven't even made those two fields required, so some people are not going to fill it out anyway, and so some people are getting a personalized email, and other people are getting dear comma. <laughs> right? <laughs> they didn't even use it. So you have to think about those things when you're, when you're building your form. So this is so much easier, right? I just type in my email address and go. And now I've, give, I've given somebody, com somebody has given me access into their email box immediately. But I know what you're saying, right? I need long forms. Like, I need 1,200 fields. You don't understand. I'm registering for, you know, like, that form. I'm doing a camp registration. And there are, like, 10 kids that, you know, per family that might register. And I don't, right? I need long forms. The truth is there are times when you need long forms. Uh, hopefully it's not the first time somebody is interacting with you. But somewhere down the road, you may need a longer form. So there are ways that we can deal with. So let's talk about tackling longer forms. First thing you have to ask yourself is, can the data be collected later, like the phone number field or an address? Do you really need a mailing address in the very first contact, or is that something that can be done in a follow-up? And saying, all right, now that I have access, now that you've granted me permission, now that you have started a dialogue with me, I am ready now to say, hey, can I get your phone number? Let's connect on the phone and let's have a phone conversation. Or can I get your, can I get your mailing address so we can send you some information? We don't need that information right from the very beginning. So can the data be collected later? Remember, these are tips that you can apply to any form. You're not going to do them to every form. But certain things you may have to look at your demographic, your user, and kind of test which things work. And you may, for a while, little while, just pull off a few fields and let's see how this form converts better if I don't ask for this information, knowing that I can get it later. The other thing you need to ask yourself is, can the data be retrieved in the background? Like some of this data, do I even ever have to ask the user for it? So most of the plugins that you'll use will probably have some sort of a user analytics uh, at, you know, extension or a feature built into it. And what, what that lets you do is you can collect IP address, you can collect the browser they're using, you can collect what kind of operating system they're using, in some cases their latitude, their longitude, uh, the country that they're in, the state that they're in. Like you can get, get a lot of data and you never have to put those fields on the form. You don't have to bother your user with this. You can just collect it in the background. But if you do have to have longer forms, there's a few other things that you can do to kind of make that easier. So you can break forms into smaller parts. So instead of having one long, huge form, you can have little micro forms that they can step through and see their progress and know exactly where they're at. Oh, I'm on page two, I'm on this section, I've only got six fields, it's not a big deal, and then I'll move on to the next section. Uh, there's a TV show that I just recently watched on Netflix where she talked about, you know, you can do everything for 10 seconds. So I just count to 10, and when that time's over, I can start counting again. <laughs> because that's a new 10 seconds and I can do anything for 10 seconds and they just keep doing that over and over again, right? <laughs> you know exactly what I'm talking about. I couldn't remember the name of the show. I'm unbreakable Someone Someone. Yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> and I thought about that and I think, you know, that's why multi-part forms actually work. So like breaking forms down into multiple parts is because I can handle three fields. And then I click next and I'm like, oh, well, I can handle three more fields. Like, that's no big deal. And I see my progress and I can get that information and that's helpful to me. The other thing you can do is allow users to save and return. If you have a really long form, I guarantee at one time what you've done is in the middle of the form, you've asked for information that your user does not have on hand at that moment. And so they have two choices. They can try to leave their computer open in that state forever until they can get that data. And it's, you know, God forbid that data is in another location, like at home or at the office. Or you can just say, hey, why don't you just register? And you can come back and, and sign in, and your data will be there waiting for you. And now, when I get that data, I can come back and fill it out. Because the chances are, if you don't have something like that in a long form, they don't want to come back. Man, I just filled out 50% of your 1,200 fields. All I needed was this information to keep going. I'm not going to even bother. And you may have lost a contact and lost permission into, the, into their email. 
Uh, the other thing you can do, which we use a lot, so here's one of our forms. You can collect and present additional information conditionally. This is the, probably the most important form on our website because this is how people get support. So we have a few options, right? My former extension's not working as expected. I have sales questions or I hate your product and I want my money back. That's actually my favorite feature, <laughs> my favorite question. We, we did that as a joke just to kind of have fun with it. And I can't, t you know, we, obviously we still get refund requests and that's just the nature of business. But now every one of them has to come back and go, oh, I don't hate it. <laughs> And I, I feel so more inclined to refund. I'm like, oh, well, if you don't hate it, here's your money back. Like, that's <laughs> awesome. Like, so that's actually my favorite question right now. Uh, but so we have some stuff. Now, diff these different people, ben depending on what they answer here, may need, we may, may need additional information from them. So for instance, if they check, uh, let me see, if they check the last option, my form works perfectly, we just send them right to the form that you cannot see because of my magical ghosting input borders. Uh, but nonetheless, we just give them the form, they can fill it out, and they're ready to go. Now, we, we break some cardinal rules here, right? We ask for first name and last name, and I said, do you really need a first name and last name? You can just say name. But they want support, so they're just going to fill it out. Like, you know, our form's a little different. That's why I said, right, one form doesn't fit all. People who are reaching out to, uh, to us want us in their home. <laughs> they want us in their email box. And so they'll pretty much fill out anything we ask for, uh, generally. Um, <laughs> I have, to take, I have to say that because, it, or I have to take that back because we many times don't get information we ask for. But if you pick the other option, this is one of my favorites, right? My former extension isn't working as po uh, uh, like I expect it to. So now we say, all right, well, what's your request regarding? So we have like top five, six, seven issues that we know they probably have an issue with. And if they click that, click that we just give them their answer. We don't have to give them a form. We don't have to give them a submit button. Why bother them to submit the form? We can just give them the answer. Just present that information conditionally. But, you know, of course, in all cases, maybe it's not working, even with the solution. They check that box and we give them the form and they can, they, you know, we grant them permission, <laughs> if you will. Now, regardless of whether you're using longer forms or short forms, there's some other things that I would highly recommend that you do to increase conversions of your forms. One of those is remove CAPTCHAs. Here's the thing. I, and I feel pushback. <laughs> By the way, I have a couple more hoodies back. If you can solve that equation, uh, just come see me and I will give you a hoodie. Four. Three. <laughs> no, I'll just give you a hoodie if you get take a gas. Because I have no idea what the answer to that question is. Uh, remove captures. Here's the thing. They're terrible. They're annoying. They're, they're actually, the whole point of a CAPTCHA is to make it hard to fill out your form. Why would you do that to your users, right? Now, I know what you're saying, but I don't want to get spam. Well, first of all, let me, let me explain. Here's another reason why you don't want to use uh, CAPTCHAs. Uh, my partner, Kevin, was, used to do, teach some classes at the public library in our hometown. Uh, and he would work with people. Uh, it was kind of like a, an, elder sh an elderly workshop. I don't know. I don't want to offend anyone. I, I don't even know. I, I'm afraid to even say what I'm saying. It's like anywhere from like 50 to 70 years old, and they're wanting to get into tech, right? And so they're asking. So, like, so one of the things he might do is say, hey, I want to sign you up for Gmail. And so he'd have everybody set up and set up their own Gmail account, get them in the email. Well, at the time, Gmail had this really hard CAPTCHA, and none of them could answer the questions. So he'd have a room of 20 people that he'd have to go computer to computer and enter the CAPTCHA for them. And most of the time, he couldn't get it right. <laughs> CAPTCHAs are terrible. So what do we do then? We want to prevent spam. There's a, there's a great technique that we use on all of our forms, and we get zero spam. And it's a simple thing called a honeypot field. And now, there are, certainly there are ways that that can be broken, but I ha I have, we get tons of traffic, and we get zero spam. So I have to assume the honeypot's doing something really, really well. Here's the basic idea of a honeypot, because you're going to say, I don't understand what that concept is. A honeypot is simply a hidden field, hidden by, by generally by CSS. And when bots come to fill out your form, and you get all that spa ugly spam, it just generally fills out every field it sees. It just every field it comes to, it just says, blah, 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 here's my answer, here's my answer, here's my answer, and it submits it. A honeypot is hidden, and it says, basically, I don't want to be filled out. And if you fill it out, the form fails. It just says, okay, this is spam because somebody filled this field out, and they shouldn't have but because they can't see it. So how did they fill it out? It's a bot, right? So that's, that's basically how a honeypot works. The other thing is it's actually accessible, too, because there's text in there that tells people if you're using a reader that says, hey, you know, this is a honeypot, don't fill it out. <laughs> like, you know, this, this field is not meant to be filled out. And then they know. So this is an accessible solution as well. And you don't have to have any of that information on there. So that's, I think, crucial. Is that a weakness for a honeypot? Uh, most plugins will have a, some sort of a honeypot solution. It's basically a field that just gets added to your form, like a first name field or an email field. Uh, and it's just, while you may see it in your form builder on the front end, nobody sees it. 
It's completely hidden. I have found it, I, I would never say anything is 100% effective, but I don't get a lot of spam. And like I said, we have, we have tons and tons of traffic. What was that? 99.9 .9. .9 maybe, I don't know. I, I'm, not, I'm not comfortable putting a percentage on it. But here's the thing too, would you rather get a little spam or not get your customers access? Like what, what's more important to you? So you have to kind of gauge that and, and, and consider your market when you're deciding, do I put a CAPTCHA, do I do a, you know, a math question? on there, um, you know, we, we've used math questions before and we've put a little excerpt on there that says really we're not trying to test your math skills, like we try to keep it as simple as possible. Although I have gotten some wrong that were really basic multiple times because I wasn't looking at it right. The other thing you want to do when doing your forms, regardless of the length, is your form structure. Now we get a lot of questions, now you can't oh. see this, this is the worst one, this is the worst one. So I had to explain this slide, I had no idea what I was getting into. I have to explain this slide. So in this, field, this form right here, it says name, and then right next to it is a field, and then down is email, and next to it is a field, message, next to it is a field. This one is just straight down the line, name, email, field, all right? So you have labels left position to your input field, and you have labels above position. Now, a lot of people say, oh, I want my labels left position, and their theory is, right, it makes the form look smaller, shorter. Like in comparison, one is shorter than the other. But here's the thing you have to consider when you're doing that, and that's eye tracking. Like when you're looking at a form, how, what are you visually seeing? It actually takes seven points of eye tracking to look at this form because you're going from label to field. You can't even see it in one shot. So it's label to field, label, field, label, field, submit. Where this other form, I can go straight down the form and I can generally see my label and my field in one shot. So you have to think about that. Think about the structure of your forms as well when you're talking about conversions. Yes? Say that again? Removing, Removing labels in place of placeholder text. That's a solution. Um, I generally am not a fan of using placeholder text instead of labels. Um, that, that, that there's a number of reasons. Accessibility reasons are, are one. Uh, also, when you gen depending on how your placeholders are configured, when you click in there, you lose the label, and so now you have to sometimes click out to see, all right, what am I, what, what am I filling out here? I forgot. And so that t tends to not be a great user experience. Um, but it's certainly a, a way, and that's, I would say it depends on the market. So some users may just be fine with that and they don't, don't care about it. So you have to kind of think of your market, who you're trying to attract and what will be most appealing to them. I would test it. Like I would do some A-B testing and say, all right, let's see what's going on here. If I do this, what kind of advantages do I get from that? Um, but generally speaking, I've never seen uh, labels done in a above the field uh, affect the form adversely. And placeholders end up actually being really helpful because my next uh, point is add descriptions and placeholders. <laughs> Right? Like if you're asking for questions and maybe you're unsure, the user may not know what to enter, ask, tell them. Add a description so you can say, hey, we're looking for this information. So in my name field, I'm asking for your first and last name. I'm not asking for a nickname. I'm not asking for, I want to know what is your first and last name. Uh, but we can, you can also put a placeholder text. So that's, you know, my, my email address in there is a placeholder text. Those are options. I would generally use placeholders to guide users as to what to fill, not to act as labels for the field itself, would be my advice. The other thing you can do is use different text for your submit buttons. It has actually statistically been proven that the, the terms like submit and send convert less than actual actionable uh, text. So what are you trying to do? Are you trying to start a conversation? Are you trying to fill out an application? Are you giving them access to something? Are you trying to give them something for free? Like sometimes just changing the text to something actionable will actually help them, entice them to submit that form even more. So this is actually uh, uh, an, interesting, an interesting experiment that I play with. Like what are the actions? What are you actually trying to get your user to do? This is a, a really important one and this is one that I see missed a lot. Make your forms mobile friendly. Now this is a really easy fix in almost all cases, but uh, you have, so you have two forms here. You can kind of see the field that's selected here and over there the field that's selected, username I think is selected and over here it's the subject. And you can see the keyboard's up, so we're already ready to start filling out that form. But one is just a singular column and what you can't tell from the look here is this form is actually bleeding off of the page. So you can actually now scrolling all over the place with the form. So the submit button's over here, you're scrolling over there to get it, and it's really bad. Here, simple fix, right? Your form fields should have a font of 16 points or better. 
Because most, of, most mobile devices, when you, when you click on that field, it's going to zoom in and make up the difference if it's not at a 16 point font. And so you get that kind of weird zoom in on your form. And if you don't want to do that, which is really kind of annoying to me, I, for the for the longest time I had no idea what was causing it. And I'm like, why does my forms keep zooming in? I'm hating this. And I hate the experience because my, now my, my, for, my site is all over the place and I'm dragging, like I had this nice single column mobile you know, responsive site and now it's all over the place and it's really ugly and that was it. 16 point font, all your fields. Selects as well, so if you have a select box and you don't have that to a 16 point, you'll zoom in, you'll still get the little selector, but you zoom in, 16 point font, or 16 pixels. You wanna make sure that you have that and that will, that will actually prevent that kind of weird zoom in and, and effect. Uh, and another thing you can do, real simply, provide a, pol a privacy policy. You're asking your users for data and you're asking them to trust, you, you trust them with your email address, maybe your phone, their phone number, whatever other information there may be. Uh, provide a privacy policy that tells them explicitly what you plan on doing, what are your intentions with them. And you can do it with a, just a link to a privacy policy. You can actually put that privacy policy right in the form if you want to. Uh, but just telling them, hey, we're not gonna sell your email address, we're not gonna do bad things, we're not gonna sign you up for porn websites, we're not gonna do any of these things, right? We're just going to start a dialogue and that's all we're gonna do. Your, your information is safe with us. And finally, the best way to increase your form conversions is offer something in return. People like getting free things and if you give them something free and if they know at the end of that submission, at the end of that data submit, I'm going to get something out of it, they are more likely to fill out that form and give you information. Uh, in the beginning of this talk, I handed out some sweatshirts and I asked some questions, some more personal like your pets and things like that. Uh, and I think they, just the act of getting a sweatshirt, you're like, oh, well, you gave me something. I'm going to dialogue with you. I'm going to have a conversation. I'm going to give you that information. So maybe you want to give them, uh, you may, maybe you have a white paper on a particular topic that's interesting to your users, and you can give that away free as, a, as kind of an enticing uh, way to get in that. Maybe you have a whole series of drip content that you want to drip out to them on, in your industry, and you want to help them out. That's a, that kind of thing will help them uh, fill out your form and convert better. Um, so that's it. That's uh, why your web form sucks, how you can make it better. Uh, my name, again, is James Laws. Here's how you can contact me. Uh, James Laws on Twitter, jameslaws.com, wpninja.com, or ninjaforms.com. And for now, uh, I'm done. We'll open up for questions and answers. Generally across the board, I, I, haven't, I haven't noticed a big difference. Uh, now granted, I have to be honest, I'm, not, I'm on iOS. Uh, we have a few Android users. Um, your Android, is it? Yeah, it's 16, 16 point font is generally, and, and I said 16 point, sorry, not 16.5. I didn't know if I clarified, I might have slurred that. So 16 pixel or 16 point font is preferable. Yeah, if you're doing a basic content form, so there's so many things going out there. So uh, if you're just doing a basic content form, for instance, Jetpack is here. Jetpack comes bundled with a content form. So if you're already using Jetpack, it has a contact form. And if that's all you need is those basic fields and no customizations, that works great. Um, Ninja forms can work and Gravity forms are both work. And there's Formidable Pro and there's Caldera forms. There are, there are hundreds of form plugins and they will all work for the basic forms. Like they're all gonna work for a basic content form. I think where you start to see yourself needing is when you get into things where you need conditionals, uh, where you need breaking your forms into multiple parts, when you need to accept payments on your form, oh, okay. things like that, you start to move into where you need to work, you need a more robust system. Now the other reason you might use a Gravity Forms, right, the other reason you might use a Gravity Forms and Ninja Forms is just simply because you want the drag and drop interface, right? Like you want to be able to add whatever fields you want, you want to be able to drag them into place and sort them and order them and you want to make that easy. Yeah, like Contact 4.7, you're doing kind of all this code, and it's like, you're like, what? I don't even know what this means. And like, w with Gravity or Ninja, you just you add your field, and you're done. Like, it's pretty simple. Can you, can you make it, like, I like my forms to, I like to customize the form. Like, usually it's only on half of the page, mm -hmm. or two-thirds of the page, and then I might have some other brackets on the other third. Can we do that with the Ninja Generally, I suggest that should, that's best done in the theme than the form. Like if you have a theme and you want to break your page up and divide your page, so sidebar and content, or you want to divide your content up in some sort of a grid layout, so you have two columns, that's better done in the theme than trying to force the form into that 
confines of that. So I would suggest you working with some sort of, uh, some, something with your theme to do that is probably a better solution than actually trying to make the form uh, be like, okay, here's a graphic and content and here's the form. Most forms can do it though. I mean, most forms offer, you know, some sort of a text element and if you know a little CSS, you can do a lot and uh, sometimes they will also have certain things that let you style your forms uh, in the yeah, UI. Like with ninja forms, can we put something else in there besides the form on that page? Yes, you can. I mean, uh, and, I, and, I, and again, I, I come back to being platform agnostic on this. Almost <laughs> all of the, uh, of the larger form plugins will allow you to put text and images and other content right into your form. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes. Collect all that data. I can tell you this is something that we, like for Ninja Forms, it's something that we want to build uh, a better reporting extension, so to speak, that can kind of collect that data and let you d um, report on data based on that information. Um, but I can tell you Ninja Forms doesn't have anything specific for that at this time. Um, I know there's some, was that? You can export a CSV and do run different things in a spreadsheet and do it that way. Yeah, and that's a solution, but right, it's kind of a, it's not an ideal solution. It would be great to have something right in the dashboard that you could just say, hey, I want to filter and look at these reports based on very specific criteria. Um, but I know some Gravity folks people are here. Uh, do you guys have a reporting, any kind of reporting in Gravity Forms? I know we don't, but. It's not super generic. Like the, all the payment add-ons have uh, you know, their own reporting specific to that payment add-on. And then like the quiz and the polls add-ons, they have their own results. But so it's more specific for a use case than just yeah, general yeah, all submissions generic, reporting. Like, I just want to see like, the results for this. Yeah. And I think, you, I think you're going to see more of those things getting built it, probably into Gravity and in Ninja Forms. I think that's a, that's a need for, for a lot of users who want to get that data and, and maybe more generic and maybe even build their own report because they have very custom needs for their data that's coming in. You just referred to uh, having the database behind it. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, there's a few ways of doing that. Zach, do you want to talk to that? Because I see you nodding. <laughs> yeah, we have, like, we have an extension. That if, you, if they're logged into your site and you already have their email address, then it can pre-populate anything attached to their user meta in WordPress. That's, that's probably the easiest way to do it. And there's other ways with like some small code snippets or conditional logic or different things that you can add or manipulate the values in the form too. Yeah. So that's another way of, I think, of limiting the amount of information that shows right. up. You can just ask for what you need like you don't already. Yeah, and, and matter of fact, a lot of times what we'll do is we'll have hidden fields that actually s populate that data. It still sends us the data, but it's hidden, so they don't even have to see it and change it. We just get that data automatically because they're logged in. Absolutely. Yes? Uh, when you talk about conversion, do you guys uh, have any research showing you uh, what kind of buttons, colors, whole fonts? I don't have any colors. I can tell you I, I'm, I'm, I'm leery to do conversion numbers specifically <laughs> because our users are such a broad stroke and they have such different industries. Um, but Formstack actually does not long ago came out with a whole big survey of the, their forms and, and what they, you know, the conversion numbers and how just removing this field increased conversions for this particular company by such and such a percentage. So I don't have hard, fast numbers, but if you just search uh, form conversion and Formstack, there is a Google article, there's an article that you can find there that they did that kind of has some, some numbers for some basic, some basic industries. So yeah. Yes? Yeah, so there's a few ways you can do that, right? So once you have, an, so once you have permission into their email, you probably, I would, I would think you've subscribed them to a mailing list, so you have all of your users. And so you can be very strategic about the next emails that come out. I know MailChimp just recently has added some, the ability to do some very specific dripping of content as it goes, right? Like you can say, okay, when I get this email, I want to do this in two weeks, and then three weeks I want to do this, and four weeks I want to do this for a particular customer. So setting something up like that, I think, would be actually ideal because you get their form, you've, get, you've gotten permission, and then you just turn around and send them an, a, a tailored email for the next step. And th but by getting that initial data and getting that initial contact, they're a lot more likely. I wouldn't, um, my general 
opinion is, I wouldn't the very next time ask for data. I would just have a conversation and kind of soften the water, so to speak, and then the next time I can come back and say, hey, now that we've had this success, if you're interested, if, if what I've said interests you, here's some other information that we'd like, to get, we'd like to get from you so we can do this. And tell them what you're doing. I mean, when you're asking for information, it's really important to ask why I'm asking for this information. And that can be very helpful. How do you feel about pop-up forms, like forms that you go to a blog and uh, Like automatic pop-ups? I detest automatic pop-up forms. Now, here, here's the thing. There's some great plugins for it. Actually, we have one that does a little bit of like, like pop-up. And I, I don't use it because I don't like it. I feel like most time users don't like it. But the numbers show, like Optin Monster is a plugin that you might look at that does this for like subscriptions. And their numbers seem to show that like people do it. Like it, it increases their sign-ups and stuff. So I think that's something you have to test with your own users and find out what kind of pushback you get. We had it for a little while on Ninja Forms, and we got a lot of flack for it. So we were like, eh, nope, next, done. Public forms in general are also fairly bad experiences on mobile devices. So if you're on a mobile phone, like, and you go to a site that, that, that has a pop-up form, the form doesn't look right on a mobile device. So if the majority of your users are on a mobile, it's not going to be a good experience for them if it's going to be a pop-up form. I don't. I, I broke it. I don't know what I did. There we go. I have, I have a yes. All right. So you're saying like, uh, you know, what is an Optin Monster? That's supposed to be pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, so that's not that's not a very good user experience as far as the numbers are concerned. So I would think um, retarget retarget is probably a better option. You know, to for more conversion. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, so things like Optin Monster. Um, pop-up pop control and different things like that. Some of them can actually, you can do some segmentation and look at the specific actions. So I don't generally like I come to a website and immediately, bam, I'm hit with a, with a form and I don't even know what I'm looking at yet. Like that, I, that, that puts me off pretty fast. But if I'm doing something and I take a specific action and that pop-up is for that specific action and, it, and I can see that it's related to the action that I took, that is something I'm more likely to look into. I don't know of a lot of plugins that do that really well, um, but, but opti Exit Intent is kind of an example of that. Oh, I'm getting ready to click the X, although I get falses on that all the time where I'm like, I'm just trying to click on your menu, stop showing me a pop-up. <laughs> like, your menu's at the top of your page, of course I'm scrolling up there. Yeah, oh, I, I see what you're saying. So is it, is it more effective to say, hey, ask for a little information in a very passive way, and then as I continue that conversation, I can get more data. Is that more effective than just, bam, in their face with pop-ups? I would generally say yes. And the reason I say that is because they have granted, again, right, it's, we talked about it's getting in their home, getting in their email. They've granted you permission. But when that pop-up comes up, I have no relationship with you yet. I don't have, you've not given, I've not given you any permission and you're, and now it's not like, it's like, it's kind of, using the door to door salesman concept, it's kind of like not only did you knock on my door, but when I didn't answer, you went around and started knocking on my windows. You know, like you're peering in, like, you know, like, like, dude, back off. Like, I said no. Like, I didn't answer my door for a reason. So if you have a form on your site and I want to access you, I'm going to come and I'm going to fill that out. If I didn't come to it, chances are I'm not going to go to it. Like, you can do nice gentle nudges and not so in your face. Yeah. Yes? Um, so I'm trying to create something where like a bigger page or form and like it'll create like a custom post. Like does Ninja have anything that's kind of better than For creating a post? Yeah. Yeah, we have a front end post creator. Uh, a plugin that basically you can add a title field, a content field. Uh, you can map any field to custom post meta. So if you have like a very unique needs for it, you can map all that stuff. And anytime the form is submitted successfully, you can go ahead and do that. You can also pair that with like a payment gateway and say, hey, I want them to pay to submit content. And only when the successful payment will go through will it go. And that can also be saved as a draft to be checked later so you can approve it. So you don't just post everything to your site. You can say, okay, this is a draft and I need to review, review that. So just to clarify, if you want to write to the custom post type, you have to create the custom post type first. It won't create the custom post type first. Yes. We collect the data. That's all we do. Um, and we will put it where you want us to put it. Um, but yes, if you have a custom post type, you would, you would first register that post type and we can connect any of that data. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Patrick. Do you know any, so like I'm looking at my newsletter sign up form and my, the widget in the sidebar has a 0.03 conversion rate, which just does not sound good. 
Like, right. do I need to offer something? Yeah. Do I, it's only first name and email. Right. And the submit button. Right. And the, I'm guessing. I'm guessing too that that's probably on every page. That's on every page. I think some there is a, there is a level of scarcity increases conversion. Like if it's on every page, it's so common. I just ignore it. I just I almost come blind to it. How many of us ignore ads? Like you see, like they have sidebar ads. They're like those 125 pixel ads, and we don't even look at them anymore. We just know that's an ad. I'm ignoring it. Like I think that happens with sidebar forms as well. I think when they're so common, I would rather see something like at the top of the page as a call to action, or at the bottom of a, of a single page, uh, and direct them to that. So I think there is scarcity kind of breeds a little bit more uh, higher conversion. I think in a lot of ways. Anyone else? Um, so, for example, most forms end up on pages, and a lot of people don't necessarily come to the page on site just if you're a heavy content marketer that comes to your blog over and over again. Mm -hmm. What do you do? I mean, can you, and I'm sure you can, I just kind of looked at this. Can you create at the bottom, add to your blog layout a form at the bottom of your post that you can edit to say, okay, you like reading this, you want to get some more from me? Rather than sticking it in that sidebar, which is yeah. You know, is there something like that? Absolutely. I mean, I think every one of the form plugins will allow you to do something like that. So you can either, in your template file, you actually just call the function for that particular form, and it'll display out there. Or if they have widgets and you have like after entry widgets, which some, a lot of themes will put in, you can put that widget in there and it'll show up at the bottom of every post. We do that on ninjaforms.com and wpninjas.com. We sign them, so the newsletter's there. So after you read the content, hey, if you like us and you liked what you read, maybe you want to fill out some more. So absolutely. I think the difference between a sidebar is it's, it's that high priority and it's in that kind of, dis I think the sidebar gets dismissed a lot. Okay. A lot of content, and not just forms, I think lots of content in the sidebar just gets dismissed because we kind of know that that's the garbage collection. It's like, here's all the things that I think everybody wants to see on every single page of my site, and so I'm just going to throw it all in the sidebar, so we ignore it. By putting it at the end of the post, what you do is you kind of get them in that linear idea, like, I've read this article, and now here's a call to action to get more information. I really like this article, but I don't want to go to this website every single time to get this article. I may sign up for their newsletter and get that information. So I think there is something there that says it's almost like a call to action after the fact, instead of before on every single page, here's our form. Yes. So on that, is there a way to identify which posts they were actually reading at the time? So that there is. Uh, so with Ninja Forms, we have uh, default values. And so one of the default values is the page or post title or the paste or post ID. And I think most of the other plugins have that as well. So I, I, again, I want to keep that as agnostic as possible. Most of them will probably have that. But you should ask if that's, something, if that's, a, if that's a critical need. You might want to ask first before purchasing something, you know, because you want to make sure it does, fits, your, fits your purpose. Uh, and I would generally put that in a hidden field, yeah. So you grad, add a hidden field to your form, and you say, hey, I just want to, I want to collect when this, form is, when this form is submitted. Send me the page title or post title with that content so that I know. And like I said, you can use ID as well if you have more programmatic reasons for using that. You could also use the ID. So, yeah. Anything else? I think, I think that's kind of my time. Is that what they said, 45 minutes? Yeah, is that correct? All right, awesome. If you have any other questions about forms, about anything else, we'd be happy to help us. Just check out, uh, look for the red uh, hoodies, unless it's somebody that I just gave a red hoodie to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, you have all, if you have a hoodie, you've been commissioned. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you.